Hey guys, welcome to Unaborted with Seth Gruber. Thank you for tuning in. We are so close to the most important election for the unborn. And so we are doing an episode a day until the day before the election, just to give you as much encouragement uh, and push that you need to defend life, to articulate pro-life ideas to your friends, family members, co-workers, people in your life maybe who say they're Christian, maybe they even say they're kind of personally pro-life, but they're not going to be voting for life. I want you to be equipped with the tools you need to persuade them as to why life is the most important right. And if we don't get that right, we're gonna lose all of our other rights. And so I hope you're encouraged by this. Please share this episode broadly. This was a conversation I had with Pastor Cody Cool of Grand Rapids Baptist Church for my Michigan speaking tour last week. And we really unpacked the worldview of choice and the ideas kind of lurking underneath the surface in the pro-choice worldview. So in this wide ranging discussion, We dive into these ideas, discuss the silent shepherd, the idolatry of choice, the religion of leftism and their greatest sacrament of abortion, the left's obsession with sex, the civic duty of Christians to engage politically, and God's gift of the law to restrain evil. All right, so buckle up. Here we go. We are joined with Seth Gruber, my new friend from Southern California. He just preached at gr.church today, did a phenomenal job uh, in both services. People were greatly equipped and helped in uh, this this, um, horrific um, travesty in America called abortion. And so you spoke in depth on that, probably not as in depth as you would like, <laughs> but no, uh, but you did a you did a phenomenal job, a great help. And any pastor out there that would watch this, I encourage you to have Seth Gruber at your church. So this is kind of just a candid conversation we're going to have about abortion, and maybe even talk about pastors and their role in this uh, in this sin. And um, I think uh, we're just going to have a good time. So I hope that this uh, po- this podcast uh, was really informative, fun, and uh, would help you in your walk with the Lord in this area. So Seth, Amen. why don't you, um, um, why don't you just t- uh, introduce yourself and just talk about uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, like, where you're from. Tell us a little bit about yeah, yourself. Yeah, awesome stuff. Thanks so much, Cody. So I grew up in LA County. I was actually homeschooled through eighth grade, uh, which probably has something to do with me having some type of head on my shoulders, um, (laughs) some type of steel on my bones. And then I went to public high school and my senior year, I did my senior project on the issue of abortion. And the reason for that was even though I was kind of raised in the pro-life movement, my mother was the director of a pregnancy resource center when she was pregnant with me. I did walk for lives every year for the local pregnancy center growing up. However, I realized that I didn't really have the tools of thought I needed you know, on a public high school campus yes. right, in a secular context to be able to defend and articulate that position short of citing Bible verses to make my case. Now, we should be able to do that because we should have a Christian worldview, right? It kind of like putting on biblical lenses mm-hmm. through which you see the world and make sense of everything that's happening in the world. And that's important. However, because all truth is God's truth, we should be able to defend and articulate God's objective truth without always citing Bible verses to make our case. Meaning, we should be able to make that defense from a natural law perspective, philosophically, and just appealing to reason, right? Reason is sort of kind of the common master, if you will. And if we don't acknowledge devotion to the common master, then we can't have reasonable dialogue in this country. This is why relativism, by the way, is so dangerous. Because relativism says there are no objective truths. There are no truths that hold across time and space. Which they're using an objective truth right. to is claim it, there are no objective Exactly. Truths. Is it objectively true yes. that there's no objective yes. truth? Because <laughs> if there's no objective truth, then how did you develop the ability to see into truth and determine that there is no objective truth yes. you would have access to yes. objective truth something you just denied exists yes. so of course um that's the hilarity of relativism as greg kokel and frank beckwith say relativism is feet firmly planted in midair <laughs> so you must have access to objective truth in order to claim that there is it no really objective comes down truth. to like an, an authority that's right it 
Like, well, that's, that's why they hate now? Christians, yes. right? That's why pagans, pro-choicers, leftists, why they hate religion and Christians. Yes. It's such a threat to their political ideology yes. because it says that actually there's a God. And not only did he create you, but he created everything. He created truth. And ultimately, he is the moral standard. So we're beholden to him. And so eternity is written on the heart of man, right? God's reign falls mm-hmm. on the just and the mm-hmm. unjust. And so even those who hate God, we will see these sort of evidences mm-hmm. of God's grace in their lives. This sort of still small voice inside of them that beckons them to truth. And right, this is the great conservative consolation. Reality always reasserts itself in the end. Because for most people, reality does tend to be self-evident. And so the goal of the left and the pro-choice movement writ large is to essentially bury reality six foot deep so they don't have to acknowledge it, so they don't have yes. to change their yes. position and their views. And as it pertains to abortion, what does that mean on this issue, Cody? Well, it means that the reality and humanity of the child is self-evident. We see these children. We know that they're image bearers of God. And the science of embryology and embryoscopy, the footage of the unborn child in the womb, is increasingly giving a window into the womb, right? Pro-lifers have said for a long time, if windows had wombs, maybe we wouldn't have abortion. Oh, that's good. And now we're seeing into this window more and more. There's a new type of footage called embryoscopy, and it's not ultrasonography footage, Cody. So it's not an ultrasound, and mm-hmm. then you're seeing the profile of the baby. It's not 4D ultrasound. It's an actual tiny camera. They insert up the birth canal. And because the amniotic sac is clear, mm-hmm. you can see the baby. Yawn, react to light, and they're providing this footage all in the first trimester. Now, we didn't show this footage today, but um, I'm happy to show it in the future or send you the clip because it's incredible. You're seeing the humanity of these children in the first trimester when only ni- when, where over 90% of abortions are performed and in which there's the most public support for abortion, yes. the first yes. trimester. So now the pro-abortion argument has become almost impossible, impossible to maintain, right? Being a leftist or a pro-choicer today – is, is basically just being a juggler, but you're constantly dropping all your balls yeah. <laughs> because it's so difficult to maintain your ideology yeah. giving the overwhelming evidence of reality it, that of makes, the child in yes, the room. That makes perfect sense. It, it makes sense why a woman who miscarried in the first trimester would weep and cry and mourn and yeah. people share their condolences to her, right? right? But then if a woman commits abortion in the first trimester, it's celebrated yep. by the left how can yeah. that be like how can how are how how do people reconcile that yeah. so there's a uh, author by the name of joseph de la pena and he wrote a phenomenal book on the history of abortion throughout world history mm-hmm. it's, it's it's a it's a bible length book and resource but he coined this term in that book cody called the abortion distortion mm-hmm. And what he was trying to communicate with this phrase was that there's sort of this atrophy happening to our moral reflex on the issue of abortion that would never happen on other moral outrages. For example, the same pastors that we'll get to in a little bit who are claiming that the unborn child somehow doesn't deserve political protection or if they do, it's not their place to use their pulpit to demand Christians to stand in the gap politically to protect these children Mm -hmm. would never say that about sex trafficking or slavery. If sex trafficking and the trafficking of eight-year-old girls in the sex trade were legal in America, these pastors would never insist that I can't wax political. I can't talk about that. And I certainly can't tell my church that they should use their political voice in a constitutional republic where we the people have the power and use that voice to vote in such a way that restrains the evil of sex trafficking and makes it illegal to traffic little boys and girls. They would never say that about sex trafficking. Then why do they say it about abortion? Because of this idea of the abortion distortion. There's an atrophy happening to our moral reflex on on the issue of abortion. Do you think that's because they can't actually see the fetus? Or is this more of a cultural I think it's both. I think it's both, right? It's, it's, It's easy to avoid loving neighbors that you don't see. Yes. It's easy to avoid loving neighbors. Because when you see an eight-year-old girl getting abducted or is the victim of child sex trafficking, it, it really hurt, hurts your heart. And in and, and, and our service today, I wish you guys would, he showed the video of yeah. babies that were aborted in the first trimester. It was so moving. I was brought to tears. People, I look around, people are, people are in tears. It's very moving to actually see that these babies in the first trimester have hands. Yeah. They have legs and arms. And it, 
it really, I think for a lot of people, it's woken up yeah. their... Yeah, talk about being woke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it woke us up. Well, it it's was important amazing. because it proves the humanity of the unborn child and the inhumanity of abortion. Yes. And 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 it exposes the deeds of darkness, as Ephesians 5.11 and tells us to do. But going back to what you were just saying, what we were just talking about, the second reason why there's this sort of moral atrophy happening on the issue of abortion in the, in the response or reflex of Christian leaders and pastors is because of the power of normalization. You know, Noam Chomsky once said that good propaganda uses terms and language that no one's opposed to. Hmm. That's the whole point of good propaganda is who would be against that? Or right? Black Lives Matter. Exactly. Yes. So how does the abortion issue pitch their language? Well, reproductive health care, reproductive justice, Pro women's choice. rights, feminism, women's yes. equality. Yeah. Right? Exactly. And Black Lives Matter, Inc. They partner with Planned Parenthood. They promote abortion. Well, I guess unborn black lives don't matter. So you see euphemisms and the power of normalization and propaganda – it relies on using words that nobody has a problem with and that everyone will get on board with. Yeah, because you sound like a bigot now if you stand against that kind of language. Exactly, yes. exactly. because if you say, well, I don't like I, – I agree with the inarguable proposition that Black Lives Matter, but I disagree with Black Lives Matter Incorporated, yes. which is running a lot of the movement because they sanction the slaughter of unborn black lives. And then they say, oh, you don't care about black lives? Like, no, I just told you I do. I just care about them from the moment they're human. Yeah. But they create these words such that if you oppose it, you do look like a bigot. And so this is the power of normalization, right? This is why it was so easy for Christians to just allow themselves to be pulled downstream in Germany and America in 1850 because the Holocaust and slavery were sort of just culturally accepted institutions and norms. Never forget the Holocaust was legal, right? So the people would tell them, well, abortion is legal. It's a constitutional right. So what? Legality doesn't always equal morality. And certainly that was true in our country yes. on the issue of slavery. Yes. That obviously was not moral. And so we actually had a political duty, regardless of precedent, regardless of stare decisis, we actually had a political duty to overturn bad precedents because they were not protecting the natural rights of individuals that this, that this country was founded on. That's but so good. this abortion distortion, right? Mm -hmm. So this moral atrophy happening on abortion. You were talking about just a couple of minutes ago the irony or contradiction – between those who mourn the death of their children in mm -hmm. miscarriage and then those who celebrate the slaughter of those same children if they're not wanted. Where we saw this most recently was with Chrissy Teigen and John Legend, mm -hmm. who just recently shared the tragedy of their miscarriage yes. on social media. Yes, and if I you go to that. Chrissy Teigen's Instagram account, guys, I believe she racked up like over 11 million likes, something just nuts, right? Um, Mourning the loss of her baby. Who they named Jack. Mm -hmm. Think about that. So this was – they weren't referring they to this him. as a tissue. Nope. They had actually named him. They wanted him. Now, here's why this gets really creepy and disgusting. Chrissy Teigen and John Legend have donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to Planned, Planned Parenthood. Parenthood. And guess who was helping lead the charge last year when pro-life states were passing heartbeat bills to get Hollywood to boycott these states and not do business there or produce or film there? Yeah. John Legend. He was leading the charge asking Hollywood producers to not do business in Georgia, who was trying to pass a heartbeat yes. bill, which would ban abortions after a detectable heartbeat um, around eight weeks. So he is, one, helping fund with his wife and boycotting – helping fund abortion and boycotting states that want to protect unborn children. But then we're supposed to mourn with you because you lost the baby that you wanted. Oh, exactly. That's the, that's that's the key, isn't it? Wanted. Yes, and this, the value of a baby is based on the want of the mother. That's right. That's it. Yep, and that's disgusting, evil, and immoral because it's the same ideology that justified and drove the Holocaust. Yeah, we these don't Jews want these are not people. Wanted. They're not wanted. That's They're good. an inconvenience. We wow. don't like their religion. Wow. We don't like their noses. Whatever they, whatever ways mm -hmm. the caricatures they yep. use to dehumanize yep. the Jews. They're not wanted. They're a drag on society. And then, of course, they, they, they blame the Jews as they always do. Anti-Semitism mm -hmm. for everything. And by yep. the way, anti-Semitism that anti-Semitism has a very comfy home in the Democratic Party. It really does. It, it does. It so. Does. Um, so that's – I mean – but these are the ideas that you're not supposed to say, right? That's the quiet part. You're mm -hmm. not supposed to say that out loud because we could say – and this is quite a fair way to say it – Chrissy Teigen and John Legend fund the dismemberment of children 15 weeks older than the child they lost who we were asked to mourn over. Jack, that's incredible. That's incredible. Then you have actors and actresses. And singers. I think the singer of Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. Uh, yep. What's her name? Uh, Nikki. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Stevie Nicks. Stevie Nicks. Yep. 
just she just says, came out the yeah. other day and she said, you know, if I didn't get an abortion, you wouldn't have my music. You wouldn't have Fleetwood Mac. We've watched we watch movies where an actress. There's a movie we really like, you know, The uh, Greatest Showman. There's an actress yeah. on there who who got up one day and Michelle. said, you know, she got an Oscar. Yeah. She said, if I didn't have an abortion, I wouldn't have won this Oscar. And here's a Oscar sitting on the mantle of a woman at the sacrifice of her own child, which... Yep. That golden know, statue should have been a golden statue of Moloch. Yes. Just crazy yep. what these people are saying. Well, we talked about this today in the service, didn't we? Yeah. That Satan doesn't care the name of the God that you sacrifice your children to. Mm-hmm. And so for Michelle uh, Goldman, um, who you just referenced, her child was an acceptable sacrifice for her career well-being and her money that she got to make because of that. For an you know, Oscar. We've seen this from many other Hollywood um starlets who insist the same thing that they wouldn't have the life they had if it weren't for abortion many times they won't call it abortion in fact you know what in her golden globes globes acceptance speech she didn't use the word abortion do you remember that i don't she just called it a woman's right to choose because uh can't acknowledge reality got to keep reality buried six foot it's crazy i i i I told my wife this we have four kids okay i said you know the greatest accomplishment a woman could ever give to society is not to become a ceo or, or an actress it's to give life to another human being. Right. I can't think of another greater... You'll be called sexist today for saying oh, that. Oh, for sure. To, I, think, I can't think of a, a greater accomplishment in life than sacrificing your own life for the sake of another yeah. person, yet they're doing the exact opposite. Yeah. Sacrificing the life of others for yeah. themselves. Yep. It's so... Listen, it's, as a pastor, I'll say that it's evil. It's against the Bible, and it's oh, wrong. Oh, it is against the Bible and the gospel, because the, the gospel says, I'll die for you. Yes. Abortion says, baby, you die, die for me. Yes. It's a complete inversion of the gospel. For a pastor yep. to not speak out against this, or to kind of take, a like you said, a gray, yeah. neutral uh, position on this. What do you say to a pastor? Because I think Tim Keller just came out and said, hey, yeah, abortion's evil and all that, but the Bible doesn't really say how we should... You know, fight against it. Yeah. I would firstly remind someone like Tim Keller, before we get into sort of, sort of, sort of the sure. political aspects of it, of what Peter Kreft, um, a Catholic, Protestant turned Catholic uh, philosopher actually, once said about abortion. He said that abortion is the demonic inversion of the sacrament because it also says, here, this is my body, but with a demonic opposite meaning. Wow. Here, this is my body. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. Hmm. But instead we say, this is my body. I am my own God. And yeah. anything I sacrifice is for the betterment of my life. And so hmm. children become an acceptable sacrament wow. on the altar of abortion and leftism. Make hmm. no mistake, abortion is the sacrament of the secular left. Everything since probably 1973 has become about abortion. Not only does abortion poison babies that it kills for the abortion pill, but it has also poisoned our politics because it's made all political discussions about abortion. Those political discussions used to be a lot healthier because you could engage with people who acknowledge natural rights. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Democratic Party prior to the 1970s was a completely different party today. 100%. In fact, I would make the moral case and political case that all registered Democrats of the 1850s and 60s would today be registered Republicans. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I would put money on that, that nearly every, maybe 99% of registered Democrats from the 1950s and 60s would today be MAGA Trump supporters. From the 1950s, not the 1850s, right? No, the 1950s and 60s. Yeah, Yeah, would today be MAGA Trump supporters. But once we accepted abortion on demand in 1973, everything became about Abortion And that party became, once again, the party of bigotry that they were from the 1850s. They said that blacks were the property of their plantation owners whose land they lived on. And now they say that babies are the property of their mothers whose bodies they live in. Mm. But with the case of the baby, the baby is exactly where it's supposed to be, where the slave was not where he was supposed to be. He was not supposed to be on someone else's land treated like property. So you could almost say that abortion is even a greater inversion of the natural order because it says that babies who are in the exact location they're supposed to be in and from which we all came and from which Christ entered human history in ought to be slaughtered and, and sacrificed as an acceptable sacrament on the ideology and altar of secular humanism, leftism, and career well-being. Abortion is ultimately 
our right to simply define those out of existence that create difficulties in our life. It's about us deciding who lives and who dies. It's our attempt to deify ourselves into modern gods to determine mm -hmm. who gets to live mm -hmm. and who gets to die. And pastors who don't understand these spiritual realities are going to fold. They're going to embrace apathy. Yes. And that apathy is deadly. Mm -hmm. This myth of moral neutrality has been one of the most dangerous things in American evangelicalism today. This idea that somehow there is a neutral position on these matters. On life. And there are many matters that we could embrace a neutral position on, like our favorite flavor of ice cream or our favorite cereal. Yeah. Or maybe even other some theological disputes, which I think you and I would probably agree are not hills that we would die on. No, they're not fundamentals of the Exactly. Yeah, we, we, we wouldn't refuse to associate in ministry with others because of those sure. disagreements. But life is the most fundamental right. And the very beginning of the human story, right? God creates life yes. in his image. Now, these were the only human beings who weren't created in a womb, but then the rest <laughs> of them were, right? Yes. And then Christ enters human history and associates with us, not only at our most vulnerable stage, but at our earliest stage, preborn children, right? Scripture tells us that, that Christ can identify with our weaknesses, right? Mm -hmm. Having experienced all that we have. So mm -hmm. we have this great high priest. Yes. Who, who, far from being removed in this, this you know, sort of ethereal deity that we can't associate with, actually put on our flesh. But he put on fetus flesh. He put on embryonic flesh and entered oh, the womb a of a woman yes. whose womb he had created himself. Yes. I mean, talk, you want to talk about the miracle of the incarnation, Christ becoming a fetus, dwelling in a womb he created? So all of these spiritual realities, which are quite beautiful and phenomenal, and not to blow the mind of the Christian, that the creator of the universe, far from just wiping us out as is, as is his right to yeah. do, actually identifies with us from the moment we become human. So to refuse to speak out against that as a pastor is not to take the position of neutrality. It's actually to take the position of complicity. Tim Keller has written in previous writings, Cody, about the cowardice and complicity of Christians in the 1850s for not acting politically to end I was slavery. hoping you would you would apply this to so slavery. Let's pivot. Yes, yep. do I, it. I did a big uh, sort of catapult setup to launch us into this I conversation. I hope you guys are getting this because what Seth is saying is incredibly important because if you adopt this philosophy as a pastor or as a Christian that, well, we don't need to say anything about abortion— Okay, well then apply that same logic to um, to 1850s slavery, That's right. right? And apply that to other cities. Go ahead and, and explain like you did to our church That's so right. well yeah. um, Amen. how Thank that applies. So, so Tim Keller wrote a New York Times piece two years ago in 2018 that gets shared very broadly, sort of every gubernatorial or local election and certainly now presidential, called How Do Christians Fit Into a Two-Party System? They don't. That was the name of his article. And he starts with the inarguable position that Christ is neither a Republican or a Democrat, that Christ is about politics. Sure. I mean, Christ is political because he's the king and he's coming back, so yeah. he's political in that well, sense. Well, he did create He's government. a monarch, right? He's the one who invented exactly. government. Exactly. He's so the only he perfect monarch, so he is political. But you know what I mean. And yeah. everyone agrees with that. The church is above politics because we are you know, exiles in this yeah. land, right? Yeah. And yeah. we're citizens in heaven, and from it we await a savior. And so... You can't find salvation, forgiveness of sins in politics. Amen. So he starts with that inarguable position that we all agree with. Um, and then he begins to move, and he starts to discuss the political duties of Christians, right? So now he's moving from this sense of spiritual grounding that we have in the gospel and our identity as sons and daughters of God. And then he, he starts to go, now, how does that have bearing on politics? Very interesting, mm -hmm. especially given the irony of where we're going to get to yes. on his failure on abortion. But he begins to say, you know, Christians in the 1850s, and I'm paraphrasing, um, he says that they were sinning through omission or commission by not engaging in the political process to end slavery. Now, he doesn't mention political parties, but we need only ask the question, to engage politically to end slavery in the 1850s meant voting for what party? The, the Republican, Republican Party, yeah. which was founded on ending slavery, yes. right? Yes. Now, again, he, Tim Keller is, he is more afraid of, um, Offending. of, of politics uh, then, you know, a modern leftist is of a, a feminist Christian woman. But I mean, so he will not use political words, but we all know what that meant to yes. end slavery yeah. in a political way yes. meant to vote Republican. 
Um, and then, therefore, he says that Christians who opted out of the political process, so they didn't vote for either party, okay. party they just opted out and abdicated their spiritual mm -hmm. duty to be salt and light in the culture. He says, and now I quote from this New York Times yeah. article, in so doing, they were, quote, supporting the social status quo, which was slavery. So what is Keller telling us? He's saying that there's no such thing as moral neutrality. And then Dietrich Bonhoeffer has echoed this as well. And I'm mm -hmm. sure Keller sort of pulled on his theological writing in crafting this article when he said that silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. It's true. God will not hold us guiltless. And Bonhoeffer said this about his own genocidal country. Mm -hmm. So it, yes, it does have bearing on the issue of slavery, which is wrong for the same reasons that the Holocaust were wrong. It denies rights of personhood to image bearers of God while dehumanizing them in order to justify their mistreatment. So that's beautiful and all that's good and fine. But it begs this question, Cody. If it was a moral wrong to abdicate your responsibility to act politically to protect the slave, which meant voting Republican in the 1850s, wouldn't it have been a higher degree of sin or a greater moral wrong to vote for the Democratic Party of the 1850s? If opting out of the political process was a sin, according to Keller, yeah. and in so doing they were actually supporting slavery, no such thing as moral neutrality, then it would have been greater wrong to vote for the Democratic Party of the 1850s because <laughs> then that would be actually be a sin of commission, yeah. directly aiding and abetting and helping expand the institution of slavery. built on mistreating, whipping image bearers of God and treating them like cattle. So Keller lays all this out in this 2018 article. And then he has this line, and he says, to not be political is to be political. He says that in that mm -hmm. article. Mm -hmm. So he's saying if you pretend like you could opt out of a political process when the context you find yourself in is state-sanctioned slavery, then you're actually being political because you're enabling the atrocities to continue while enjoying the liberties you have as a white person and not using those political powers to restore that same mm -hmm. rights to the black image bearers and neighbors in our midst. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that this all becomes so wild and the reason why I built out this whole premise in case of his is that on abortion, far from saying the same thing, he actually betrays the unborn and, and That's a good, figuratively good stabs them right in the neck. Because, again... To not, not to speak is to speak, not, yeah. to act, not to act is to act. So if there is no such thing as moral neutrality on moral outrages, and abortion is a moral outrage because it kills human beings created in the image of God without proper justification, then doesn't the unborn deserve the same political protection as our black brothers and sisters? According to Keller, that answer is no, Cody. That's insane. Because he writes in his Facebook post three weeks ago or just less than a month ago, that because the Bible doesn't tell us the best way to decrease or end abortions in this country or which policies are most effective, the Christian has liberty of conscience. And he says that directly after his comments on abortion. So what he's saying is that unborn children, their blood doesn't run deep enough or hot enough to warrant his political intervention That's in incredible. a constitutional republic completely unique and exceptional in human history where pastors like Keller actually have political tools that they can use to till the soil of the culture, Promote righteousness and restrain evil insofar as they can, given current political realities. But he says, slaves deserved political protection from Christians, but unborn babies created in the image of God in a womb that Christ entered human history in don't. That's incredible. It, it blows my mind to think that protecting the innocent in the womb is subjective that it's that's it's not something that we should as pastors be speaking out against and standing up for well, good. Romans 13 <laughs> you need to be submissive to the yeah. governing authorities yeah. let me ask you something what do you say to pastors like Tim Keller and others who have bought the lie that abortion is political and then secondly they've bought the lie that the church is not supposed to be political unless we're being obedient to the governing authorities as Romans 13 calls us to be what would you say to them yeah well, I mean, I was, I'm in the, that text thread, you know, obviously with Romans 13. As soon as the government infringes on our rights as Christians, our biblical rights, as and, Americans. And, and, and it was Americans, but once they ask me to violate my uh, the authority of God's scriptures, I throw out the government and I adopt what God says, obey God rather than man, right. is how I'd respond to Romans 13. I think in that context of Romans 13, it was talking more about like being part of an insurrection and overthrowing the government right. more than it was about disobeying orders. That's right. And as a as a, an American, 
this is just, you know, biblically speaking, if we're talking about authority, we are the authority. That's exactly like, right. Like, like, That's I, exactly they right. They represent us. Yeah. They're it's not, funny because these pastors will tell us, you know, I need to contextualize the gospel to modern America oh in the 21st goodness. century. And I go, you're right. We, you should, like we, should, we should apply gospel truths and principles and make sure that we understand the context in which that letter Thank or you. things were written so that we understand how it does or does not apply to us today. So Shadrach, oh, Meshach, how, and Abednego. How do we do that to Romans 13? <laughs> Let's see. Obey the governing authorities. Uh, was that written to people in a constitutional republic uh, where political power is in we the people? No, yeah. it wasn't. Yeah. But that's us. That's the us. governing authority is us. You serve at our pleasure because we voted you in. All they do is represent us. And that's determine it. who will govern us. Yes. Politics is merely the art of the possible. How are we going to create the society we live in? Which laws are we going to accept or not? And who are we going to determine that we give power to govern us? Yes. And if they misuse that power, or if they betray their commitment to uphold the Constitution, which do. is simply protecting life, liberty, and property, but they're not protecting then they life. ought to be voted out. Amen. Amen. They need to be voted out. And if Christians had adopted that responsibility from the beginning, prior to 1973, before the sexual revolution, mm -hmm. how much saltier and preserved would the culture have been? We stopped preaching righteousness in mm -hmm. our pulpits. We stopped holding government to account. Cody, who else can hold government to account? Is cancel culture going to no, hold government to nobody. account? Nobody. Is our is... universities going to hold government <laughs> no. to account? No, they're being is funded. Black Lives Matter going to hold the government mm -hmm. to account? We're the only institution that can do that. Because this republic was founded by a lot of fiery preachers mm -hmm. who love God. Yeah. Remember de Tocqueville, when he came to America, he said, I looked for America's greatness, and I didn't find it in her beautiful rivers. Mm -hmm. I didn't find it in her wonderful Congress. I didn't find it here. I didn't find it there. I found it in her pulpits ablaze with the fire of the gospel. Amen. And Amen. we were the preservative in the culture. Listen, that is not the goal of the church. The goal of the church is the Great Commission. Make disciples and disciple disciples. Yes. To teach them to obey all yeah. that I have commanded you. That's true. But part and parcel of that is being salt and light in the culture. Because how can you preach the gospel to the broken, the lost, and the pagan if you're not in the ecclesia? If you're not in the public gathering? Gathering, but that's the declaring problem. Declaring the gospel. Yes. Oh, nope. Let's just take our ties and stay in our air conditioned buildings or heated buildings <laughs> when we're here in, in Michigan at this time. And let's just hope people walk through the doors. No, you need to be out in the culture, yes. out in the society, yes. out in the public square, yes. sharing one, the wonderful good news of the gospel, but also holding government to account, saying, You're created to protect life, liberty, and property. Government doesn't create these basic rights, rather, their job is to recognize. And protect, protect them. them. And as yes. soon as they fail to protect them, or worse yet, attack those founding yes. ideals, then Americans have the right to reassert their natural rights and protect them. This is why we have the Second Amendment, by the way. If government is refusing to protect these rights, or worse yet, they're actually launching attacks on our natural rights, we have the right to take up arms. Yes. We are the militia. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean, as some people You think, just triggered like a whole bunch of people just I know. <laughs> that doesn't mean that, that we as Christians are excited about that. No, of course not. Right? And yeah. some people think that like, oh, Christians, they, uh, how can they be pro-life if they support killing people with guns or whatever? Okay, listen. I would never use a gun except to protect my family or maybe to go hunting, right? Yes. Oh, now I yes. got PETA up yeah. in my group. Yeah. But, you know, th that's what that's for because our founders understood and had the historical understanding yes. of how – Authoritarian governments always began by removing guns and ensuring that and they God. were the only ones that had them. Yes. Exactly. Now, again, we're not going to get into like a gun control debate. My only, my only point about that was that that was how important natural rights were to the founders. Yes. That they wanted to ensure that had government neglected to protect those rights or launched a full-scale attack on those fundamental rights, that we had the right to reassert our natural rights and protect them. <laughs> Hey guys, I hope you're really enjoying this conversation between myself and Pastor Cody Cool of Grand Rapids Baptist Church. He's a real blessing and he is a man standing in the gap, opening up his church for the broken, the hurting, the lost, and the unborn children in our midst. Listen, if you're enjoying this conversation, these are the kind of ideas that I'm trying to get in front of young people. This is what I articulate when I go into schools all across the country, youth group churches and conferences, and the content that we're increasingly trying to create to push out onto social media. 
and to get people to think differently, change their minds, change their hearts, and even save lives and equip you to do the same. So if you want to support this show, go to patreon.com forward slash unaborted and become a patron of the show. Please patronize us. Let us reach more people. You'll see some really exciting perks and tiers there on Patreon as well that will give you more tools to engage and access to me and fun conversations online and exclusive Facebook group and a lot more. So if you want to help us do that, uh, please consider doing that. We'd be honored to have you on board. Thanks so much. And let's get back to our incredible conversation. Just, just think about this. Like the founding of our country happened after the Enlightenment. Right or the Great Awakening, not the Enlightenment. <laughs> that yeah. would be horrible. You went the too Great far Awakening, yeah, the way, great way awakening. too far. The Great Awakening, and you know, it, it, people love to say, "Well, it's separation of church and state. Church shouldn't ins- assert its moral, you know, morality on us." And you know, it, we separation of church and state. We we believe in the Constitution when the Constitution was actually inspired by yeah. Christians themselves. Yeah. We are endowed by our Creator. That's right. Uh, and He's to protect, That's and right. our government's to protect our life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And so it's like you see God all throughout our founding fathers' documents. That's right. The Even separation. if they weren't born again, they were all theists. Yes. And they understood where rights came from. Yes. Yes. You know, and, it, it, and the separation of church and state was written by Thomas Jefferson to the Dansbury Baptists. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. People don't understand they, what that means. They don't. They just yeah. they think it's somewhere in the Constitution. They think it, it means to prevent religious individuals who are religiously motivated to seek to enshrine their religious views and policy. And that, that's not what that yes. means. Separation of church and state means that the church, I'm sorry, the state, the government cannot adopt the adherence to or require the adherence to a specific religion. Specific religion. Because then that's theocracy. And, mm-hmm. and that runs counter to the idea of natural rights because you can't, you're not truly freely choosing God yeah. if your government is saying repent or else, choose God or else. I'm so, glad we live in a country where you, you're free to be an atheist, you're free right. to be a Muslim, to be a Christian, to be a Mormon, to be whatever you want to be. Because it means when you accept the gospel, you're choosing, you're choosing it, rather it. than out of yeah. fear of a theocracy. Yes. So that's what separation but, of church and state means. It doesn't mean that religious individuals yes. or Christians should be prevented from seeking policies yes. or electing governments and politicians that will hold the same worldview that they So, do. check this out. So, now you have Amy Coney Barrett. This is a good segue. Yeah. People, especially the lip feminists, are freaking out because she's a Catholic. And we know that they, right. you know, predominantly hold to a more pro-life, yeah. you know, stance. And most of them do. Very pro-life. Right. I love that about the Catholics. Right. Unless you're a fake Catholic, like uh, Nancy Pelosi. Oh, you my know, goodness. Or, uh, yeah. Which I've been told yeah. she is a strong person of faith. Right. I saw this great <laughs> meme one time. It was Nancy Pelosi looking I think very, very cream. scary and creepy. And she had the Lent on her forehead. Yeah, so I saw right? that. And yep. it said, hey, Nancy, try giving up abortion for Lent. Yeah. And I was like, amen, dude. That's I mean, you're, she's one of the most radical pro-abortion she members is. of Congress, Speaker of the House, of course, one of the most dangerous individuals to unborn children in our country yep. and in the world. And she says she's a Catholic and she prays for the president. Yeah, sure you do. Yeah, right. You've been launching full-scale attacks on unborn image bears your entire life. You're not a Catholic. And now we're told that Joe Biden is a faithful Catholic. Oh, my word. It's just a garner vote. But, yes, Amy Barrett is an Orthodox Catholic. She's an Orthodox Catholic. Went to Notre Dame. um, Highly regarded. Probably one of the best candidates for the Supreme Court that we've, we've seen in a long time. People, feminists are freaking out because they know that... She, you know, she's a pro, she's pro-life probably in a personal level. Yeah. Um, but what their argument is, we need, she needs to separate her faith from these decisions that are, yeah, yeah. she has to be loyal to the constitution, but yet right. the constitution was inspired by yeah. the Bible. And right? not only that, let's take it a step further too, Cody. It's only Christians, Protestants and Catholics, people who, who hold to a Judeo Christian worldview. Yes. It is only those religious people who are levied with the accusations that they must keep their faith out of the public square. They must keep their faith out of politics. What do I mean by that? Leftism is a religion. Yes. It's a secular religion. Yes. It has religious views, some of them very weird and mystic, yes. and uh, it has a worldview. It has a, it has a sense in which it makes sense of the world. Now, we would say that that, that, that sense leads to nonsense. It's a nonsensical view of the yes. world. But what yeah. I mean is that they have a worldview in which they place all of these policy debates and issues within a larger, I mean, religious context. The religion of the left could be called secular humanism, mm-hmm. right? That man is the ultimate 
sort of realization of all that there is. And their we, prophets. We are our modern our, gods. We've yeah. deified ourselves. So, so therefore, anything I do, any action I perform, is simply in the pursuit of my happiest good. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is pure sexual revolution yes. stuff, right? If it feels good, yes, do, do it. it. And of course, abortion came right out of the sexual revolution. But the leftism, or secular humanism, has very strange, weird, mystic religious views itself. Sure. And I'll tell you about one of those in a second. But they're not levied with the accusation that they should keep their faith or their religious views yes. out of the public square. So it's only weaponized yeah. by leftists who hate Christians yeah. and the ideas they stand for in order to silence them. Yeah. For example, the left believes that women can be men and men can be women. And if you're a boy but you feel like there's a little girl inside you, then actually the real <laughs> you, the real you is that little girl in there. Yeah. It doesn't matter that you yeah. have male genitalia. It's crazy. It's it doesn't crazy. matter that you yeah. have male chromosomes. No, the real you it used to is, be not, gender is not the Cody sitting in front of me. If Cody thinks he's a girl, mm -hmm. the real girl is somewhere in there. That's a very <laughs> mystic, weird religious view of the soul. Yeah. And it's called body self-dualism. Yeah. It actually has a name. It's called cool. body self-dualism. The, okay. the idea is that the real you is not the physical person sitting in front of me who has a soul. Hmm. The real you is your thoughts, your aims, your desires, your motivations, your relationships, things that we can't tangibly touch. And it's touch. subjective, right? Totally it's subjective. subjective. This is also why they believe that unborn children can be humans but not persons with no value. So that makes sense why they would celebrate um, you know, abortion but then cry at the loss of a child unexpectedly. Exactly. That would make that would Because it's totally sense. subjective, right? Subjective, yes. They just weaponize truth. Um, to serve political ends. I don't know why anybody would follow a politician who was subjective because you wouldn't know where they stood on anything. That's right. Right? Yeah. At least if you're a Catholic or any kind of religious person, yeah. you could look to a book and be like, well, at least we know where they stand objectively yeah. on moral issues. If you're not grounded in an objective moral worldview that demands certain... Um, that demands that you act in certain morally good ways and restrains you from acting in certainly morally bad ways. Mm -hmm. If you're not grounded in that type of worldview, then yeah, you're just going to go where the wind blows. You're going to do what Joe Biden does and lick his finger and stick it up and see where the wind's blowing. Yeah, I mean, fracking, if I can speak a little, bit, a little bit frankly, <laughs> uh, this is maybe a little bit crude, but these people are just kind of like a fart. They just blow where yes. the wind goes and yes. wherever they land, it ends up stinking. Yes. That is so good. Seth, this is such a good conversation. <laughs> that is awesome. It's so true. Um... Let's talk, you, let's talk about self-governance. Okay. I, I want to hear your thoughts, too. Yeah. Um, what I would love you, What would you say to the pastors um, who are shutting down their churches, yeah. probably never preached out against abortion? What would you say to them about sort of the Christian's role or duty um, in the political sphere? Because we don't want to identify with politics as Christians. That's not our identity. No. Right? We don't want to become so committed to one political party that— our identity to ourselves and to the to the world is more obviously that than it is Christ, yeah. because that would be making a god. It would be yeah. it would be making a god out of something else. But but just in our duty, like so, what would you say to Christians, people listening to this, pastors, mm -hmm. especially with how polarized we are politically? Yeah. What is the role of the Christian in the in politics? Well, self governance is the most talked about governance in the Bible, right? Self control. Like, how are you? Like, like, you know the you know the one verse that every every non Christian knows is "Don't judge," right? Okay. Of course, it's taken out of context. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the whole point of that Matthew six is: look, before I help you with your issue, I better have this like big gigantic beam or moat out of my own eye before yeah, I help yeah. the splinter out of your eye. Right, right. So <laughs> yeah, self governing yeah. is extremely important because if you can self govern, you don't need. Yeah. A civil government in your life, right? Zero. Yeah. Why? Because you're civil. You're virtuous. You have character. You have discipline. You work right. hard. You take care of your wife and your kids, right. yeah, yeah. or whatever it is. So, self-governing is the most important governance from the Christian viewpoint than anything else. Mm. And the fact yeah. that Christians or humans are looking to po political figures as mm. the yeah. savior That's right. of society That's is a great so point. horrible because. It really starts with the individual, mm -hmm. right? They're abdicating their personal responsibility to master themselves first. Master yourself. I love what Jordan Peterson says about this. Like, fix yourself before you start fixing the world. Before you lecture Fix us. yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the second form of governance that I would that I would advocate for is family governance. Like, yeah. hey, if you're a dude and you're married and you got kids, yeah. take good care of them. That's right. How shall a pastor 
rule the church if he can't rule his own house well. That's rule right. your own house well. That's right. Before you start like you know fixing your community, yeah. make sure you're loving on your wife. You're loving on your you husband. Know, that's so. That's really interesting given our current political moment, Cody. Yes. So let's get political for a second. I love it. Um, Trump. Okay. People hate him, right? Sure. Call him a womanizer. Yeah. You know, uh, twice married, three times divorced. Uh, you know, twice divorced, three times married, and. You know, we have we remember the tapes from 2016. How oh, you're a celebrity, you can do whatever you want with women, and and oh, he speaks bad of women. Okay, look at his kids. Mm-hmm. They all love him. Charlie's made this point multiple yeah. times. Look at look at the president's kids. Yeah, they seem to have mastery of themselves. They do. They have a good marriage. They have children who seem to respect them. Ivanka they was don't just seem here to in Grand be, Rapids and just yeah. glowing. They don't seem to be sleeping around. There doesn't seem to be family yeah. scandals. Yeah. Okay, so yes, Trump is not perfect. He has great moral failings. So do we all. God still use Samson. Um, <laughs> but if we're going to take this route of you, you probably shouldn't be governing others if you haven't figured out how to govern yourself or your yes. own home. And this is very biblical, yes. right? Um, such that some of the requirements for elders or leaders and are, just in a church. are how your children are. Yes. Are they walking with God? Yeah. And pastors who take that seriously, actually, if you're going to be biblical and take it by its word, you're supposed to step down. As pastor, if your children are not walking with the Lord, or if they're out of control and yeah. you're not dealing with that's it. right, it doesn't mean so you have, your children have to be perfect. Yeah, but you, but if they do mess up, you're dealing with it. Yeah. If you just leave it alone, how, right. how are you going to deal with the sin in the church? Yeah, if you're going to deal with the sin in your home, yeah. so it's a biblical principle. Yes. So let's yes. apply that to this current political moment. Yeah, what is going on with Joe Biden's son right now? Oh my word! Now again, let's not get totally into that, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. BLM, Biden's laptop yeah. matters, right? Yeah, but I'm just saying <laughs> that clearly, Joe. I mean. You can't blame parents for every action their children makes because yeah. self responsibility, right? Individual responsibility. We understand that, mm-hmm. but we we also are a product of our environments, right? Mm-hmm. And and solid children who love the Lord and walk with God are morally upright tend to have really good parents. Often, yes. so if we're going to use that principle, right? Yeah. Then that principle alone would suggest that President Trump is probably far better situated in terms of a moral compass in order to try to point the culture in the right direction. Sure. If we're just going to take that principle. I mean, I mean well, since when Joe, Biden has, Joe Biden has an illegitimate grandchild because his son was sleeping around and pay, refusing to pay child support yeah. for the child of the woman he impregnated until yeah. he was forced to do so by a court. I mean, this is gnarly <laughs> stuff, right? And we don't really want to get to what they found on his laptop. Yeah. So, but it all goes back to personal responsibility, personal individual responsibility, responsibility yes. because the only this, person we can truly change with 100% success rate is ourselves. We can't force others to change. Yes. They have to choose that. And this directly applies to abortion. Yep. I'm telling you because it does. This is why God says not to have sex before marriage, okay? Because now because sex is a god today. It is people worship it. Oh yeah. It's 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 what they think about, lot not everybody, but well, this the is left what is, a lot of people. The left has always been obsessed, obsessed with, sex. with it. Yep. They're obsessed with it. Gender. It drives sex, everything. It it, it really them. it really does. And because of this obsession, it's created in, in pop culture, music. It's pushed on these kids. They have sex before marriage. Yep. Um, and all of it, by, by the way, goes back to their view of the person and the soul, body, self, dualism. Sure. Yeah. Because they just think we're pounds of flesh. And the real us is somewhere floating around in our soul or it's our thoughts and or aims and desires. And so therefore, s- sleeping with as many people as you want, aborting as many babies as you want, doesn't really matter. Because the yeah. body, the flesh... Flesh and bones, that's not really us. And kids, and depression so, is higher than it's ever been in, yep. in America. Suicide is up higher than ever, ever before. Yet we have the luxuries of the internet. Yep. We have wealth beyond we've ever seen. Yep. Comforts. Well, the, but you know what you put your finger on too, Cody? Mm-hmm. The difference between liberty and libertinism. Yes. Right? Yeah. Liberty is the freedom to make the right choices yes. within a system that will protect your fundamental liberties and yeah. rights. Yeah. Libertinism is weaponizing liberty, pretending that you're free, but you're actually enslaved to yourself. Yeah. You're a slave to yourself. You're a slave to your own desires and sin. But you're just justifying all of your actions yeah. under the mantle of freedom and yes. liberty. But yes. That's not liberty. You're enslaved. Yeah, brother. that's good. That's and, really and good. And this bears directly on the issue of abortion. And this is why politics are important. Mm-hmm. This is this is this yeah. is a good point that maybe we'll and we can wrap up on. But there are two ways to restrain evil, at least, at least, the family mm-hmm. and the law. Raising well, good children with a good moral compass and good ideas yep. restrains evil. And this is why the best social science we have so far, 
the best longitudinal studies that we have have shown that children fare best in a whole cornucopia of different yeah. uh, categories yes. when raised by their biological married parents. That's why I never, and, I never understood why BLM would be against the nuclear family. I know. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, because like, they hate the family. They think it reinforces patriarchal systems isn't that of crazy? oppression. Yeah. But that's why Candace Owens would get up and say, look, the, the, the two top areas that are harming black America is the illiteracy rate and fatherless homes. Yep. That's right. right. If those two things were fixed, but that's well, why after I got the great the family. After the Great Society Act, the uh, amount, the percentage of children being raised by single parents, usually single mothers, mm -hmm. skyrocketed. Yes. In fact, right after slavery was ended, was some of the highest percentages of nuclear families we had. Mm -hmm. and you <laughs> Isn't know that gnarly? And so they, as we got less racist, as we got more free, as we became more equal. We are fundamentally equal at a yes, natural level, yes. but you know what I mean? From yeah. a political recognition standpoint, the black family was harmed more. And that was because of the state stepping in, goes right back to our conversation, and pretending like they can solve issues that only individual responsibility yes. can. Yes. So the family restrains evil. Good family structures restrain evil. Church is evil. But the law also restrains evil. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, regarding this silly critique that you can't impose morality, mm -hmm. He said, the law cannot make the white man love me, but it can keep him from lynching me. Mm. And that's important too. That is why God instituted the government. That's right. He first to be a terror to the evil and to encourage the good. That, that's it. Mm -hmm. He started the family first. If that broke down, well, then, then the government. Yep. That way we have a civilized society. Yep. And then he started the church. So here, life transformation happens in the context of relationship first with God. That's right. Then your fellow believers, that's right? right. But think about this, Seth. If everybody, if everybody in the country got saved, wouldn't that be wonderful? Revival broke out. Wouldn't that all be phenomenal? And people self-governed. Right. We're filled with the Spirit, yielded to the Spirit. Right. The government would become... But we still need the law, right? We need because, the law, but because, less of it. We sure. need less government intervention well, that's in the life. Idea of Cops would be bored. Exactly. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, we would need yeah. less government. Well, the Not assumptions that we don't need of government. our founders was that there would be good family structures in place. That's because and that's morals why they, and rights that's right. are very important. Yeah, the laws of nature rights, and nature is God. Yeah. And they, that's why they supported, one of the reasons they supported federalism and local control over local communities is because they believed that the way to protect liberty and freedom the most was enabling individuals to f to structure their own lives around their values, which at that point were largely Judeo-Christian values, yep. and that that was going to promote the well-being and good of the community in which you live. Not at a state level, not at a national level, local individual yeah. communities. Yes. But even in a, I mean, you want to talk about a utopia. I mean, America is the greatest utopia we're going to get in this life, in this fallen flesh, yes. right? Yes. Because it's the most exceptional it's government amazing. we've ever seen. Yeah. Now, Why are it's, everybody it's, flooding to come here? It's not as... It's not as great of a utopia now as it was 100 years ago yeah. because increasingly we have a ruling class that is running our government and our politics. Yes. Right? These still, wear a mask. It's the law. Hmm, I don't remember voting for that law. I don't remember. Right? Prop 8, Roe versus Wade. <laughs> These are all things that, that uh, either – Prop 8 in California, we said, yes, we're going to protect the natural institution of marriage. It's only the union of one man and one wife. And the course went, nope. Yeah. Excuse me? Yeah. So we're increasingly being ruled by this ruling class, taking away the democratic will of the people to vote freely on how they want to live their lives. But even in a perfect utopia, as much as we can in this fallen flesh, we still need law because we understand man is fundamentally flawed. Man will always try to rule over one yes. another. And this is why we have all these checks and balances in this republic to create it. gridlock, yes. to restrain man from trying to take over other men. That's why it's so important. And that's why it's so dangerous right now, why Democrats are saying we're going to pack the courts, we're going to abolish the filibuster. We're going to make D.C. a state. We're going to weaponize the institutions that were created for separation of powers to restrain evil and create gridlock in the system. All um, for power. All for our political power. Yeah. And, and you know where that's going to prove a danger more than any other sphere? Abortion. Abortion. It's going to, it's going to pose the greatest fear. But that's why law is important is because even in an ideal republic where we have self-governance, man is still wicked and fallen. Yes. And this is the fundamental assumption of conservatives. The fundamental assumption of the left is that human nature is endlessly malleable. Right? Obama said the, you know, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice, meaning we're always getting better. We're always perfecting ourselves. <laughs> and this is why relig religious people look to God to fill the religious hole in their heart, but leftists look to politics to fill the religious yes. hole in their heart. And that's why you get this deification and sort of uh, godlike treatment of Ruth Bader Ginsburg because they viewed her as the singular figure holding back the patriarchal pro-life Republican Party yes. against the pro-life 
policies of President Trump, they viewed her as this like godlike seawall to um, theocracy, which in reality, <laughs> they just viewed her as a, a, a pagan abortion uh, queen God figure, to, yes. to, to promote abortion. Yes. But why do they create celebrities out of political figures? Because they're trying to fill a religious hole with politics. Yes. So we need law to restrain these types of people from those power, and we need law to restrain ourselves from taking over others. Yes. But nowhere has the attack on these natural institutions that were built on natural rights posed a, a greater danger than to our unborn neighbors. I totally agree. Because they're Think the most this. victimless. Think about this. They're so the you, greatest victims. They are the greatest victims, 100%. And they're the most voiceless. 64 million people have been murdered in the womb. In America alone since 1973. It's unbelievable. But think about this. Somebody gets saved, right? They start loving God and loving others as themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if that breaks down, let's say we don't love God, we don't love people. Well, the law is the only thing holding them back from, from tyranny. Yeah. And that's why rights and morals are so important. Yeah. It's like if, if you have rights that's but right. no morals, you have anarchy. Yeah. And if you have morals but yeah. no rights, you have tyranny. That's, that's right. why you have to have both that's together. Well said. That's so, well said. And can, can I just talk about the hubris of Christian leaders, pastors, or just individuals within the church who refuse to act politically and that to protect the unborn or even to protect their own natural rights? I mean, who, what hubris? Like, you sit there enjoying these natural rights. Until they're gone. To free speech. Yeah. To raise your children how you want. To homeschool if you choose. All of these rights that so many people around the world don't have. You enjoy them. You take them for granted. Mm -hmm. You're, a, you're, I mean, you're a freedom glutton, and freedom gluttony <laughs> turns into libertinism, yes. which turns into slavery. Yes, and then we become a slave to ourselves. Yes. And you take these things for granted. You enjoy your Netflix and chill. You enjoy all of these wonderful freedoms in America, and then you say, "Well, man has fallen. Both political parties suck. They're both sinners. I can't vote because I couldn't, I couldn't honor my conscience and vote for that party." It's like. What ivory what tower are, are these people about? living in? Jesus Christ, as Jack Hibbs recently said, is not coming on Air Force One. We will be voting for a fallen <laughs> sinful candidate regardless. Have some of these pastors been voted in as the pastor of a church? Because they're a sinner right. too. That's right. Regardless. I mean, if God is going to use Samson, who every time he called him, he was in bed with a prostitute. Yes. If he's going to use yes. King David, who's sleeping around after playing Peeping Tom and then murdering the woman's husband. Yes. I'm sure he can use us. And we see him use pagan kings throughout sure. the Old Testament who were not friends of God, but he still used yes. them. So the basic biblical principle is that God can use anyone. Right? Yeah. So are you going to vote for someone who on the surface looks nicer, right? But even Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Yes. As the Corinthians tells yeah, us. Saying, what, it's not a pitchfork you know, are, are you yeah. gonna Are you going to vote for the guy who may look like an angel of light but is inward a demon? Because what's more demonic than abortion? Yes. And guess who is the greatest pro-abortion political ticket in American history? Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. Yes. So you've got a demon inside of them yep. who is waiting to devour children. Satan is a lion who roars, who goes around looking for people to devour. Satan is the dragon in Revelation waiting to eat the prenatal Christ who's about to be born by Mary. Satan is always beyond the killing sure. of babies. His minions are always beyond the killing of babies. And those minions have the safest home in the Democratic Party, which dehumanizes babies and slaughters them. Or are you going to vote for a fallen candidate who hasn't had perfect marriages, seems to have obedient, wonderful children, may or may not be a Christian, but is committing to protect the natural rights that you take for granted and apparently are not willing to vote to protect anymore. You're going to have to give an account to yeah, your children absolutely. as to why they don't get to enjoy the freedoms you did get to enjoy. And the freedoms in a republic in which has encouraged generosity and the proclamation of the gospel and the funding of missions yeah. here and all abroad because of the way that this yeah. republican yeah. government is built. If we can't get the right to life right, we're not going to get any other rights right. And the Christians who can't vote against the genocide of baby image bearers, I wonder, Cody, what can you vote against? Yeah. Or what can you vote for? Yeah. Now you got Joe Biden in his recently, recent town hall saying that eight-year-old boys who think they're girls have rights. Yeah. What rights? Let me I tell know. you what he meant by rights. Yeah. He meant that the government will step, step in, in yes. if parents tell their eight-year-old boy that he's not a girl, he's actually a boy, their, take yeah. them from there because they yeah. have transgender rights and have the right as eight-year-old, even though they can't get ibuprofen without their parents signing off for it, yeah. they should have the right to cut their breasts or their male genitalia off and pump them with hormones, chemically castrating them so that they can feel like the other gender. Yeah, if you can't vote against that yeah. or vote against the genocide of baby image bearers, yeah. what can you vote for yeah. or against? It's unbelievable. I don't know how all these people are. They're so blind. We're going to give a personal account to God for our involvement, either protecting the unborn or 
supporting their slaughter yes. because there is no the, neutral position. You know, when history is rewritten of this time right now, I want to be on this side That's right. of history. I want history to be written by like Cody Cool, Seth Gruber, Charlie Kirk, That's Jack right. Hibbs, all these guys That's right. stood for the unborn, voted with their conscience, right? It's amazing to me how many how many guys uh, you know, we, we talk about as pastors like, "Oh, we God's got to be in every part of our life, no closed door except for politics." Yeah. I know it's wild. You can't huh? have politics. Yeah. What? Oh, so close that door to and God, sex. right? And sex. The the, what, the pastors wait, increasingly, what? pastors increasingly are like, I, you know, okay, I don't, yes, yes, I must be because I, 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 it's just so clear. Not for you, but yeah. for many pastors, it's politics and sex that they, okay. that they won't tell Christians they're sheep. Are you saying sex they, like? Well, I'm going to tell you gender that they or? Uh, that they ought to offer as a sacrifice to God. Right? We're called to offer everything about us. Yes. What we own. Our families, everything to God is a fragrant offering and yes. sacrifice. But then, of course, they say, "But not your vote." Yeah. God, your the gospel has no bearing on that. But then, how many pastors will tell people? Um, the Bible says, "Children are a blessing and a heritage before the Lord, like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Blessed mm-hmm. is he yeah, whose quiver is full of them." How many pastors are going to tell the church and their sheep? Um, listen, I'm not going to tell you how many children to have or not have, but like everything else in your life. Your sex with your spouse and your reproduction ought to also be brought before God 100%. as a fragrant offering and 100%. sacrifice to God. So wh- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in trouble with this, okay? <laughs> Men or women who t- tie their tubes or get vasectomies without praying, without talking about mm-hmm. God, without including mm-hmm. God in that at all, yeah. are fundamentally, functionally, mm-hmm. they're telling God um, – you know, I know you said children are a blessing and a heritage yeah. for the Lord. I know you created my reproductive system in a certain way. And when you did that in Eden, you actually said it was good. But actually, I've determined that, like, actually at this point, it's actually not good. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not an open womb theorist. Yes. These people who say that women should have as many babies as yeah. should be biological yeah. possible. I, yeah. That's not me. Yeah. That's silly. You're saying we did, and that we can also be dangerous. 100%. Right? But, but how many Christians have adopted the same assumption of the culture, which is that we can just choose how many children we want to or not to have. And once we feel like we have two and a half with a p- white picket fence yeah. and everything is too our liking, then we'll tell God, um, I'm going to pay to tie my wife's tubes or I'm going to get a vasectomy because I determined this. Yeah. It's sex and it's politics, you, that the, the, the yes. two things that pastors won't say, actually, those do need to be included within the whole sphere of things that we put before God as a Amen. fragrant af- offering and sacrifice and say, God, what would you have me do with this? Seth. Are we stewards or not? That's so good. That's so good. I, <laughs> we, we had a really good conversation. Yeah. <laughs> that was incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to our church, being a blessing. I hope those who watch this were greatly Let, Yeah, let's try what to get this to take just, off and get it's this fire. Before, what you people, said was fire. before they hit the poles, man. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Seth. Yeah, appreciate brother. you, man. You're, you're a warrior. Keep Thank standing you. for truth. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. I'm so glad we're friends. Absolutely. Amen. Thank you.